Good morning, Sabbath blessings. Uh, welcome those joining us through YouTube and Facebook and those joining us through uh, the Room on Pal Talk. Uh, we want to get started into our study, very important study. Of course, they, they all are when you open the Holy Word, aren't they? They're very important. God's Word is important to us. It's uh, the words of life, and we wish to have life, do we not? Uh, before we get started into this study... Let's have a, uh, a short season of prayer. So I invite you to uh, bow your heads with me in your hearts. Let's come before the Lord. Father in heaven, we do thank you so very, very much for uh, this holy Sabbath day that we can come apart from all the cares that we have in our, our everyday life, uh, the battle against self and against the devil. Uh, and uh, we come together to worship thee in spirit and truth, to, to rest from the weariness and to gain strength from the Holy Spirit and from uh, encouragement as we read and study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be given to each one of us as we get into your word again. And we pray that uh, we may be given discernment and wisdom, understanding to know. This is a, this is a topic that can be uh, easily confusing. It can be Hard to understand at times, so Lord, please give me the words to speak that uh, people will uh, um, be able to grasp uh, this principle and and rest assured of your love uh, towards all. Uh, we pray that you will be with those who couldn't be with us today, uh, be with those who are still traveling to houses of praise and worship, be with those, please, Lord, on our prayer lists, our our uh, parents who are ill, our children who are out of the faith, uh, those within uh, the household of faith, uh, Lord, that we may be servants to them and encourage them. And Lord, we also ask that you forgive us for our sins. Uh, as individuals and as a people, Lord, we have sinned against thee and others. We pray that the blood of Jesus will cover us and for, we pray for forgiveness and help us to be overcomers. Again, Lord, I ask that you give me the words to speak as we open your holy word this morning. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, friends, when I began this series of studies looking at the sin issue, I, I said that we would define it, okay? Uh, we would look at its cause where it begins, we look at how to overcome it. All from the perspective of, uh, the, uh, of the individual, see? Because sin does begin with the individual, but it ripples out everywhere, affecting all creation uh, to one degree or another. Um, and in order to deal with sin effectively, we have to let the Lord strike it. See and rid get rid of it at the heart in each of us as individuals, and thank God we have a personal God who wants to have a personal relationship with each one of us, and that opens up the opportunity for Him to clean us and to set us on the right path to hit the mark of God. And as we learned in the early parts of of these studies, sin begins in the mind. And its fruit ripples out from there to our family circle. It ripples out to our neighborhood, uh, the church, our nation, and world. Uh, and until the Lord God through Satan and his angel followers out of heaven, it was even there. Now the size and speed of the ripple, <laughs> this ripple effect, is dependent upon the type of sin and some other factors. You know, I'm sure many of you have, when I was growing up, we used to play in the, the cricks and ponds around here, and we would take stones and throw them into that clean uh, water of a pond and see the ripple. And the ripple depends on the size of the stone, doesn't it? And maybe even the speed of the stone and, and such. So, um, so friends, you, you can think, and there are many people who do, that what you do behind closed doors has no effect on anyone outside those walls. But I'm going to tell you, according to the Word of God, you are mistaken. The wages of sin is death. And that even includes ignorant sins, as we learned last time. Just because it may be done in the privacy of your home does not mean 
that it has no ripple effect. Lucifer created an incredible ripple while he was co covering his sin from the view of other angels while he was there in heaven. Which brings me to this study. Because Satan and his angel followers as a group were removed from heaven, what may that say about the idea of corporate sin and corporate accountability? Is there such a thing? And if so, what part do I play in it as a human being and as a Christian? What is my responsibility as a, a member of the great Second Advent movement? And so I hope to show how important it is for us to understand uh, the answers to these questions and that we as a people will act upon the truth we discover. That's one thing that, that uh, we should always do. When the Lord shows us truth, we need to uh, make it a part of our very life. We need to act upon that knowledge and not just have it in our heads, friends. Now, ever since the revival of interest in what took place at the uh, 1888 uh, Seventh-day Adventist General Conference session there in Minneapolis, and especially with its aftermath, there has been projected upon the Adventist psyche the concept of corporate repentance. And I'm speaking mainly to Adventists about this uh, subject, uh, though this truth should be understood by all Christians. But I'm speaking mainly to Adventists because it is to the Adventists, those Seventh-day Adventists, that the three angels' messages were first revealed, and to them the Lord commanded to share with the rest of the world those most important messages, the last messages of warning uh, to the world. And within those three messages... In Revelation 14, 6 through 12, in particular, the first angel's message is the judgment message found. That judgment truth. And in that message, we've been told that there is an order to God's judgment. In 1 Peter 4, verse 17, it says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, you know, when, when I first read this scripture about the judgment and where it was to begin, the question uh, that I had that popped into my mind was why? Why must it begin at the house of God? And the answer has to do, friends, with the subject we're going to study. Corporate accountability, corporate guilt, corporate sin. In fact, when we consider the beginning of this great conflict, uh, this great controversy uh, between good and evil there in heaven, we can see that God did indeed begin in his own house by dealing with corporate sin right there in heaven. Now, a few studies ago, I put a little bug in your ears. Uh, about this subject and, and said that if we understand this issue, if we understand it better, then it would take it would make some of the the decisions of God that we read about in the Bible uh, make sense to us. You know, like causing a worldwide flood to, to destroy man, um, his destruction of wicked nations, his destruction of entire families, including women and children. Uh, in his decision, you know, to leave the people he first chosen, to leave Israel to be, you know, uh, the, those people he chose to be a nation of priests. Why did he, he leave them in order to begin a, quote, new church, which really wasn't new. You know, uh, it was getting back to the truth. Um, but, see, friends, understanding this particular topic of corporate sin, corporate accountability and such, uh, will help us to see that these decisions by God that we read about were not just arbitrary acts from an offended God. Understanding this topic correctly will also help us to see the reason we must remove ourselves uh, from fallen organizations uh, and, and Babylon. 
So I hope this will open a lot of eyes to God's order of things as we go along. But like I said, there was a revival of interest in what took place at the 1888 uh, SDA General Conference session there in Minneapolis, and with its aftermath, and this was due wholly to the research, the writing, the preaching of two men, Elders Robert J. Wheeland and Donald K. Short, and they started doing that and revealing these things since the 1950s. Incidentally, uh, Elder Short's son, also named Don, uh, was the pastor that first baptized me into the family of God back in 1985. And like most people, you have a soft spot in your heart for the pastor who baptized you. And uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for that man. And, uh, and friends, let me say this. You know, I'm a person that believes that God does things for an absolute reason. Are you? Are you that kind of a person? God doesn't just do things arbitrarily and he doesn't just do things on a whim. He does things for a reason, because he has our best interest at heart always. And, and I believe that. And I don't think it's a far-fetched conclusion to make that God had Pastor Short transferred to Lafayette so that he could introduce me to this subject that we're going to be talking about today, as, as well as a, a correct understanding of righteousness by faith. And let me tell you, friends, I say this because when you first give your heart to Christ and you ask him to show you the truth, let me tell you something. He will move heaven and earth to show you the truth if that's what's needed. He'll do it. And so evidently he had to move Pastor Short to Lafayette. That's kind of the way I look at it. And it wasn't in, you know, I wasn't in the faith very long uh, before I was introduced to the history of those messages given by Alonzo T. Jones and L. J. Wagner there at that GC session, clear back in the year 1888, as well, again, as the books that were written by Wheeland and, and, and Short. In fact, you know, uh, not too long after I'd been baptized, Elder Wheeland came to our church and presented the topic in a series of meetings, and as a result of those meetings, I have studied this, this subject uh, and the, the tangents to it uh, from uh, more and more for over 30 years. And, uh, you know, I call that a Holy Spirit thing. Is that a Holy Spirit thing or what? You know? <laughs> now, even though these men, uh, since then, they've waffled a bit over the meaning of corporate repentance, um, if the experience that these, these brethren called for in the beginning had occurred, then there would be no need, you know, for any further study, any further consideration or other aspects of corporate accountability. In fact, I wouldn't be preaching about it right now. We may be already have been in, in the kingdom. And so, you know, this is an important subject for us to, to delve into, especially when we're talking about the sin issue. Now, while our God is a God of mercy... He is also a God of justice. His spirit will not always strive with men, we're told in Genesis 6 and verse 3. And so while the times and seasons do remain at his discretion, we're told in Acts 1, there is no record, friends, in all of sacred writ. You can't find it from beginning to end in God's word in the Bible where he granted unlimited time in which to repent. And thank God for that, because sin would probably be immortal then, because there's always someone being born, there's always someone growing up, there's always someone with the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. Now something's going to happen, see, and, and, and force two sides. You're going to have to choose, see, choose this day. And the whole world's going to have to choose. There are going to be two sides in this. And thank God for that, because that means there's going to be an end to sin. And praise the Lord for that. So, there comes a very real aspect when we consider this, that there's no unlimited time in which to repent. There's a real aspect of corporate accountability or corporate guilt and what God will do about it, and we need to understand it. 
And, and of course, with this is involved our individual responsibility. So, that we begin this study aright, we need to understand, um, you know, in order to understand what I'm talking about, let's get a definition, a clear definition of the term corporate. Because some people's eyes glaze over when you start to talk about corporate accountability, and they're, then they're off headed somewhere else, you know. Um, but let's define the term corporate. This word comes actually from a Latin word, and that word is corpus. And it basically means body. Basically. Very simple. It's what it means, body. To incorporate is to unite so as to make a part of another body. To be mixed or blended together, you see. To make a group into a body, a single unit composed of a few or many members, okay? Such a corporate body that is religious in nature is called a church. Do you see that? So in this study, I want to, to let you know, be aware of, so, you know, so that you're not confused, in this study, I use the words corpus, body, and corporation interchangeably as they basically mean the same thing in this context. And, and so I do that so that we become accustomed to it. We, you know, have you ever read, <laughs> I remember when I was in the English class in high school, you, the teacher would teach us uh, when you write a particular sentence in describing something, you want to be very descriptive and whatever, you use a number of different words that were synonymous to get your point across. And so that's what I'm doing here, using the word corpus, body, and corporation. They mean the same things here in the context of what we're talking about. Uh, and I'm hoping that that will help to eliminate any future confusion when you hear the word corporate, you know. And such. So, I'm I'm praying that this will make it easier to understand. Okay. Now, in Scripture, when we talk about corporate corpus body, uh, such a body is compared to the human organism. In First Corinthians twelve verse twelve, Paul says this. He says, "For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are." One body. And he says, so also is Christ. The legal aspects of a corporation is a body formed and authorized by civil law to act as a single person. Even though it's made up of more than one person. And it's legally endowed with the right of succession. And this is important too. This right of succession, while legally recognized in its provision for corporations, is a fundamental scriptural teaching regarding the church. And we need to understand that if we are to know about corporate sin or corporate accountability. Now, what does succession mean then? Well, according to Webster, the 1828 edition, for the word succession, he gives four definitions. And they, they are all kind of together. First, he says, for succession, it's a following of things in order. Series of, th of things following one another, either in time or place. Thus, we speak of a succession of events and chronology, a succession of kings or bishops, and a succession of words or sentences. That's what the word succession he says mean. Second thing he says is, is the act of succeeding or coming in the place of another, as this happened after the succession of that prince to the throne. So we speak of the succession of heirs to the estates of their ancestors, or collateral succession. Third thing he says is lineage, an order or series of descendants. A long succession must ensue. And I'm going to tell you, when we talk about this subject, you can see parts of each one of these definitions come into play. Okay? 
And the fourth thing he says is the power or right of coming to the inheritance of ancestors. He holds the property by the title of succession. Okay? So when we talk about corporate accountability or corporate guilt, we need to understand the definition and concept of succession. It can involve generations of people, see? And we'll see that as we go along here. Over and above and within a corporate concept, there is granted, let's not lose sight of this, there is granted to every individual the power of choice. In most instances, uh, you know, we talk about corporations, corpus, body, you know, in most instances, I choose to become a part of a corpus, a body, or a corporation. The only exception would be my natural birth, you know, with its gift of family ties, nationality, race, and citizenship. You know, I'm a corporate member of humanity, but I had no choice in the matter. <laughs> okay? And every one of you can say that. That you didn't have a choice in the matter. You were born into humanity. You're a human being. But you see, even in this, you know, I can spurn my family. I can renounce my citizenship, or I can choose another, right? However, in the area of the corpus, you know, the corporation that we call the church, I must choose what that church will be. Then, what are my responsibilities by choosing? What is my accountability because of that choice? What choice... Uh, choices does one have once he becomes a part of such a corpus, a body, a corporation, a church? Okay? Uh, and, and, and let me say this. There is and always has been tension between individual responsibility and corporate accountability. And that's not going to go away until this great controversy is over with. Man was created in the image of God. And with this image came a certain power. The power to think and to do. Let me share this with you as we talk about this. From the book Education, page 17. Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator. Individuality, power to think and to do. It is the work, notice this, it is the work of true education to develop this power. What power? To think and to do, right? It is the work of true education to develop this power to train youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. And if you go on in the same book to page 30, she says, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. Did you catch that? She says... In the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. So since in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one, the church then, though a corpus, though a corporation, though a body, to be true to its trust, has to seek the development in the individuals that compose that body. That... The, they want to restore them. That's part of what a church is, to restore its members back to the image of God, which gives them the power to think and to act, see? And that's why the church really was organized as well, to educate members not only to serve God, but to spread the gospel to others. Isn't that what the purpose of the church is? The body of Christ, the corporation? To save others? We're not going to need it in heaven, are we? We're not going to have that purpose in heaven. The conflict will be over with, right? From the book Acts of the Apostles, page 9. This is why the church was organized. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for what? For service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. So we need to know, friends, what 
God has to say about corporate accountability so that we may know how to relate as individuals to the crisis of sin and apostasy within the body. Sin in the church. And so that we can remain faithful to our Lord in carrying out the commission He's given us to spread the gospel. This is all part of that educational process. Remember where the two are together. The highest sense, the work of education, and the work of redemption are one. Okay? You see, friends... When there is sin in the camp, God cannot bless that camp, that body, that corporation, like He wants to. And we've studied that before. Remember the example with Achan. You know, God could not bless Israel because of Achan's secret sin. So when, you know, when you hear the word uh, corporate today, most people consider it to be an evil thing, you know, and some of this is due to the, you know, to the blatant evils in some corporations for sure, but in a religious sense, uh, it mainly is due to ignorance of its origin, the origin of corporation. There are many Christians who think that anything involving corporate or organization is man-made, and, and because it's man-made, it's evil. And this was the case during the Great Advent Awakening when God's faithful were uh, discussing organization right after leaving those, you know, fallen Protestant denominational churches. Some objectors to organizing into a body, you know, a corpus, would point back to Genesis chapter 10, for example. And they'd say that it all began with the organization of the first cities with Nimrod. Well, let's look at that. Genesis 10, 8 to 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, Akkad, Calne, and the land of Shinar. And so they thought that since Nimrod created the first cities on the earth, especially Babylon, and, and uh, by them he created the first corpus or body of like believers that were evil, then all corporate entities are inherently evil as they are a part of Babylon fallen. See, this was their reasoning. You know, Another thing, they said, well, these cities were a combination of the state with religion, right? church state entities and so all corporate bodies are a part of Satan's system or religion thus it's evil and then Revelation 14 8 was quoted they'd say oh and there followed another angel saying Babylon is fallen see is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and then they would quote Revelation 17.30. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, which you know shows the great apostate church controlling the beast, which is that state or political power. And so Babylon was first created by Nimrod, was a church and state, and since had fallen. And in the spiritual sense, since they had been called out of Babylon because its corporation had fallen, so any religious organization created by man they consider to be a part of apostate Babylon. You see the, the round, circular kind of reasoning here? But just, just because that happened to them doesn't mean that organization is evil. It doesn't mean that corporations are evil. It doesn't mean that the corporate the corpus, the body, is evil. Speaking about that time in the early Advent movement, notice what the prophet said here. It's a Review and Herald article. An article that was entitled Order and Organization, October 12, 1905. Yet the feeling against organization was very strong among our people. The Adventists generally, who had withdrawn from the churches of the various denominations, under the call of the second angel's message to come out of Babylon, opposed organization. 
In many Seventh-day Adventists were fearful that church organization would bring us under condemnation. We sought the Lord with earnest prayer that we might understand His will, and light was given to us by His Spirit that there must be order and thorough discipline in the church, that organization was essential. System and order are manifest in all the works of God throughout the universe. Order is the law of heaven, and it should be the law among God's people on earth. So, dear friends, being a member of a corpus, a body, or corporation is not necessarily wrong. In fact, I'll tell you that each one of us right now, we are in a corpus, whether you realize it or not, by default, because of this great controversy. And so, while it's true that Nimrod created Babylon and and those first earthly cities that were church-state corporations, Nimrod being the church and Babylon being the state, he did not create the first corporation. See, there's another error. He didn't create it. God created the first corporation, the first body, the first corpus. And I'm talking about on this earth. Its formation is described in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. Let's, let's look. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, notice this here, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be, what? One flesh. They shall be one flesh. And so, here we have two individuals, with individual responsibility, yet declared to be one in a corporate identity. They were declared to be one body. Now the next picture presented there in Genesis is the seduction of Eve by the serpent, you know, to partake of that which God had forbidden. But the question arises, did Adam have to sin because he was one with Eve. Because they're a corporation. So see, when we talk about corporate accountability, we still have individual rights, decisions, and, and that we, we can make, individual freedom within that corporation. So, did Adam have to sin because he was, uh, um, because he was one with Eve? No. The... Two were of one corporation, but each still had uh, a choice of whether to remain in the corporation or not. Man had been created, you see, in the image of God with the power to think and do that we talked about as an individual. Now, let's not get sidetracked in contemplating how God would have handled the situation had Adam not chosen to eat of the fruit offered to him by Eve, because really that's a moot question uh, in the context of what we're talking about here. However, the scripture, what does the scripture say? It states that, it doesn't state, for example, that by Eve sin entered the world. It said by one man. Romans 5, verse 17. Notice what Paul says here. He says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So, by his deliberate disobedience, Adam not only surrendered his individual responsibility, but he left God's corporation and joined the corporation of Satan. And by doing so, he passed death on to the human race. Now, 
Is that easy to understand? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, he said, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Since a corporation has the power of succession, see, death passed upon all mankind because of their identity in that first corporation of Adam. Does that make sense? Paul stated it this way in Romans 5 and verse 12. He said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The great news for all men is that God has provided another corporation, another corpus, another body. See? So we have a choice. Hebrews 10 and verse 5 said, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. A body, a corpus, a corporation. So you see, there is the corporation of Adam, and there is the corporation of Christ. Again, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, Adam's corporation, you belong in that corporation, you die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You choose to leave Adam's corporation and join Christ's corporation, you be made alive. Good Romans 5 and verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, that's speaking of Adam, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So there is, as there has always been, friends, since Lucifer fell, two corporations, two corpus, two bodies, two churches, right? And only two. When we talked about this in the series of studies that uh, uh, entitled This Is My Body, remember? About who and what the church uh, is. And we learned that there are only two churches. <laughs> two corporations. And so we see that there are only two corporations, which are those two churches. And within each of those two corporations, there can be uh, um, multiple smaller organizations or corporations, just like Paul was describing in his comparison of the body and the members of the body all being one. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's why you may have a lot of different denominations out there, but by their fruits, they'll fall under one church or the other. See? They may say, oh, well, we're the, you know, I don't want to pick on anybody. We're the you know, Eighth Baptist Church of such and such. Well, they they belong by their beliefs and the way they behave, either in the, the corporation of Christ or in the corporation of, you know, Adam, which is actually the corporation of Satan. See? And so since the fall of Adam, Paul says, there are now two corporations on this earth, Adam's corporation and Christ's corporation. And according to Paul, Adam's corporation brings death to all men. It's a fallen corporation. It is based upon Satan's government of church state. And let me tell you, if any church you see today, you know, any denomination, any church that is aligned with the state, that will assure you that it is a member of Adam's corporation and not Christ's. That makes sense? It's described this way in Revelation 17, and verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So you see right there in that scripture, it's a family corporation. It's a corporation made up of Babylon the Great, who is the harlot mother, representing you know, the great mother of fallen church of Babylon, and her harlot daughters, which are the other fallen churches that follow the mother. See, 
They belong to Adam's corporation, which, like I said before, is really Satan's corporation, Satan's church. Okay? When we look at the opposite now, Christ's corporation brings life. It is righteous and not fallen. It's based upon truth. It's based upon the law of God. It has free will and religious uh, liberty. Its members keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, who, Jesus being the corporate head, right? The chief cornerstone, okay? So again, there are two churches, two bodies, two corpus, two corporations on this planet, and that is all there are in the grand scope of the great controversy right now. You see, when the controversy is finally brought to an end, only one church, one body, one corpus, one corporation will remain, and that is Christ's. Amen? Now, understanding this difference in the, in the context of the sin issue, we can then begin to see the justification of why God dealt with evil in the ways that He has. Such as... A worldwide flood, for example. Let's look at that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6. As an example. Genesis <clears throat> chapter 6, begin with verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. In other words, he changed his mind. Look how evil they've become. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. You know, friends, we can be like Noah. We have the opportunity to walk with God as he did. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth, was, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. What do we see here in, in, in taking our definitions here of corporations? We see two, do we not? We see Noah and those who were faithful, and we see the rest of the world, right? Two corporations. And we see also the ultimate fruit of the corporation of Adam on this earth, which is really, again, the corporation of Satan who's the head, there was no more good left in man. This is what God's saying. He was rotten to the core. You know the old saying? They're rotten to the core. His every imagination was evil. Now the word imagination is from a Hebrew word that means device or formation. It's derived from a verb meaning to fashion or to form. And so their imagination was always evil. It, it, they had evil thoughts. And where do evil thoughts come from? They originate out of an evil heart. That's what Jesus talked about. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19. He said, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, right? Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, so on. Now, the heart was, you know, popularly uh, considered the center of the higher powers of the mind. 
you know, the conscience and the will. And we talked about that before in this series. A contaminated heart, friends, sooner or later infects the entire life. And it ripples out to the whole world if left unchecked, as we see in our example here in Genesis 6. It will get to a point where God will repent that he even created man. But I want you to notice here in our example, not all were in Adam's corporation at that time. Let's go back to verses 8 and 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. And when you read these words, these words of mercy, you see uh, that even in God's wrath, there's mercy. And so by them, God pledged the preservation and restoration of humanity. It's very interesting, friends, that the word grace is used first here in Genesis 6. In all of Scripture, this is the first time it's used. But it has the same meaning all the way through the Bible and, and all the New Testament where the merciful, unmerited favor of God is exercised toward undeserving sinners. This ancient example of grace and mercy, I think, friends, is a source of assurance. It's a source of hope for believers like us who live at the end of time, a time that Christ himself compared to that time of Noah's age. And so, the followers of Christ can rest assured that God will accept them as He accepted Noah. We see it right there. And then He's also, as He preserved Noah, He will preserve us. You know, amid the evil of this day and provide for our safety in the judgment that's coming here upon the, upon the world. Now, since I, by natural birth, am involved in the corpus, the body, the corporation of Adam, can I change corporations? And if so, how? Is it possible for me to change corporations? You know, Adam, when Eve sinned, Adam may have thought, well, this is impossible that I'll be able to, you know, uh, God will save me and destroy her, and I couldn't live with with her being destroyed so surely if i remain if I, or, or if i change corporations by taking that fruit and eating it god's not going to destroy that that corporation okay but we found in the bible that's not the case god has to put enmity see that's another avenue we could explore i don't have time right now but we could explore the enmity between the two corporations it's supernatural. It's placed within us. You know, and how is it placed within us? It's the same as, well, how can, can I change corporations? And, and if so, how do I do that? Well, let's look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. But as many as received him, speaking of Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, Adam's fallen corporation, nor of the will of man, Adam's fallen corporation, but of God, Christ's corporation. So with the coming of God into humanity, as Paul said to Timothy, God was manifest in the flesh. The Corpus Christi. Have you heard that expression before? The Corpus Christi. It means the corporation uh, of Christ or the body of Christ became as real as the corporation of Adam. Praise God. He loves us so much. For God so loved the world that he gave. We have a choice. We don't have to stay in the corporation of Adam. And don't miss the the fact that this new corporation in Christ brought about by God um, 
as was the first corporation in Eden, also has the power of succession. To that new body, that new corporation, which is the same as the original, that's why I use new in quotations, you know. It's the same as the original. And what's that called? Remember, when you get to the end of the carpet, a roll of carpet, it really was the first to go on the roll, and what do they call that? You get that piece, that's called a remnant, right? That new body or corporation, which is the same as the original, often called a remnant. Jesus committed the Great Commission and clearly stated that it was to endure to the end of the age. You read Matthew 28, John 14, you know. He says he would be with them by his Holy Spirit through all time. And they were to become one spirit with him as he had become one flesh with them together in that corporation that had been formed. See? Now, a very important question uh, to consider about this, and it is where most people get confused, uh, in my experience, uh, you know, um, when talking about corporate sin, corporate accountability, and things like that. Uh, and that question is this. If this succession, is this succession, we talk about succession and we defined it, is this succession organizational, or is it the succession of truth. In other words, do we find the truth by submitting to the church? Or do we find the church by submitting to the truth? In John 14, 6, Jesus declared something. What was it that he declared? He said, I am the way, the what? truth and the what the life who is jesus he said i am the way we're going to get to that the way um here it's really interesting um, but he says i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me no man can leave adam's corporation but by me if you want to join my corporation to see the Father, you have to come to me. I'm the only way. See, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so the only access back to the Heavenly Father and to life, remember, for all uh, in Adam all die. We read that, remember? The only way is through Jesus Christ. He's the way. Remember when... Um, Remember when Jesus was alone with his disciples in the region of Caesarea Philippi and he questioned them about whom the people perceived him to be? You remember that, that story? The disciples had heard various uh, uh, comments as they, you know, they mingled around with all the multitudes who were always following Christ, who came to listen, they came to be healed. They heard every, all these different theories and things about Jesus, who he was. And so, Jesus gets them together, you know, he says, well, who do they say that I am? You know, and they, they bring up the things that they had heard. And then he asked them directly, remember? Matthew 16, but whom say ye that I am? Remember he asked the disciples that question? And they were all silent except for one disciple. Who was that disciple? Do you remember? It was Peter, Right? Peter responded, and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I want to tell you, this perception of reality, in contradiction to what he appeared to be, which was a man, you looked at Jesus and you saw a man, right? That perception came to Peter only through divine revelation from the Holy Spirit. The rest of the disciples were silent. And if the Holy Spirit hadn't given that to Peter, he would have been silent as well. It could not be comprehended through the insight available to the flesh and blood, you see, but came from the Father which is in heaven. It is upon this revelation of truth, friends, 
truth that is divine in origin, truth that is solid as a rock that Jesus declared he would build his church, his corpus, his body, his corporation. Matthew 16, verses 16 and 18. Let's read it. It says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Peter, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. You're a small pebble. But upon this rock, myself, a boulder, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to have a corporation. So a man will have a choice. And the only way to the Father is through that corporation. Not Adam's corporation, mine. Jesus, you see, the very embodiment of truth became the head of that corporation, the corpus Christi, the body of Christ. And Paul perceived this nature of the body of Christ when he wrote in 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, notice what he says here, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the what? Truth. The pillar and ground of the truth. In the margin, it's very interesting, in the margin it reads, the pillar and stay of the truth. The pillar and stay of the truth. I found it quite interesting in our opening hymn today. Uh, that word stay is used. It says, When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. What does stay mean? The Greek word means a prop which makes stable. It means a support, a buttress. The Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, the corporation of Christ, the church of Christ is to be the pillar, the stay of the truth of God, and thus the visible means through which truth is to be revealed to mankind. Its platform and base, its foundation is the truth. And Jesus is the truth. And let me tell you, only as it adheres to truth can it truly be the church of the living God. And it's not merely, friends, to assent, give a mental assent to the principles of truth. It's not enough to have the law and the prophets. The Jews had that, right? It's not enough to have hospitals and schools and churches all over the world. The truth of God must be re fully reflected in the life of the individuals and thus the corporation, the body. And through the atoning sacrifice of, of Calvary, Jesus made it possible, you see, beloved, for the sons of Adam to become the sons of God, thus changing their identification from the corpus of Adam to the corpus of Christ, from the church of Adam to the church of Christ, the body of Adam to the body of Christ. And this accomplishment of Christ and the provision thus made for man is spoken of as the way out or the exodus when you look at the original Greek manuscripts. For example, before I close. In Luke 9 and verse 31 of the Greek Bible, in telling of the coming of Moses and, and Elijah to Jesus at the time of the transfiguration, it states that they spoke of, quote, his decease which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. His decease, it says. The word translated in the King James Version as decease is the Greek word exodus, or the way out. 
the way out. So those who proclaim Jesus as the only way to the Father, as the sole source of salvation, you read about there in Acts 4 and verse 12, were dubbed by the Jewish religious leaders as followers of the way. Followers of the Exodus. And to the Hebrew Christians, Paul could write of that new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. The concept as to what constitutes succession in the, the body of Christ, the Corpus Christi, the Church of Christ, whether it's you know, organization or whether it is the truth, I think is vividly contrasted in the confrontation between uh, Paul and the lawyer for the hierarchy there of Jerusalem in his arraignment before Felix. And uh, we'll get, continue that the next time we get together as we start to put pieces, pieces of the puzzle together in understanding corporate sin, you know, corporate accountability, that's corporate repentance, and, and what it has to do uh, uh, about me living today. Why do I need to know this? And we'll discover that. Uh, as we you know, get further and further along into this study. Let's bow our heads now and let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we again thank you so much for this Holy Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity, first of all, that you created us uh, with the freedom to choose. And we have consciences and we have wills. And that uh, we have an opportunity, even though Adam chose to uh, form uh, join that new corporation of Satan, uh, Adam's corporation here on earth, that you give us an opportunity to leave that. We can choose to leave that and join the corporation of Christ and be a member of His body. And so, Father, we thank you so very, very much uh, for your love for us and in uh, not wanting to give up on us. That you love us so much that you want to give us life. Give us another chance. Please continue to be with us. Help us to have understanding these concepts so that we may make right decisions and uh, not only save ourselves and be among those who are saved, but to help others to be saved as well. We pray in the blessed name of Jesus for these things. Amen. Amen and amen. Oh, friends, first of all, I want to thank those who have joined me uh, joined us here on uh, uh, Facebook and, and YouTube. Uh, we'll be here uh, next Sabbath. We'll continue this study. So uh, mark your calendars and uh, be sure to join us again as we continue this most important study. We may have a right understanding of what is truth and follow the way, not man's way, but Christ the way. We'll see you next time.